with us, and some of the old engineers like to keep low water. But it, if they would give me half a chance, I'd get that glass half full anyway, because I, I wanted to see it. Because when you topped over a hill like that, see, going up the hill, you had plenty of water. Right. But last time, if you were running low and you topped the hill, that water disappeared. Yes. So I can understand why you were concerned about that boiler. Yes. What, uh, what, saw, what sawmill was it up there in that lot? Who had a mill up there? <coughs> they called it the Pine Tree Lumber Company. And you know, uh, Mr. What? Guy Hodges was, was uh, was a superintendent up there, and Myrtle Hodges, his niece, was in my class. She lived yeah. in that, the press house behind me, she was on Robinson Street. That Hodges. Mr. Hodges. Guy Hodges. Now, I don't, I'm, Claude Strange hadn't come in at that time. I said, well, Claude, they, Claude Strange never did uh, own that mill up there. I, they moved it. I see. Oh, they moved that mill they away. They moved that mill away, yes, sir. Well, Paul, when the and you say it was it was in 27. Well, you, well, the preacher told your family that that it, it was going definitely going to move. Yes. Sir. Well, when did the first men begin to move? Well, the first men uh, moved in in the late 1927. Well, uh, how did they do it? Did they give the oldest men the first preference? Or? I think they did. I, I don't I don't know just how they did work it. Yeah. The only thing. You know, you know, in the old days up the shop, they'd give you a metal check when you went down in the morning and checked in. They gave you a check with a number on it. Yeah. To, I feel that Papa's time slipped for him, and that number had to be on there, but he knew it from memory, and he'd tell me. And um, but then when they turned those checks in, after they, as I said, after they finished at 1099, when they checked in that evening, uh, while they gave them transfers and passes uh, to Paducah, Kentucky, you see. Uh -huh. And of course they had trains running through, passenger trains at that time, and they could go up on 26, you know, uh, to Fulton and then catch a train. I imagine what some of them did was to go right on up there and get the seniority established and work a few days and then laid off and came home and made arrangements to move. Yes, sir. But some of the older ones probably said, I'm not going to move, I'm going to hold on here as long as I can, and I guess some of them did. If they were within just a few years of their retirement, they just stayed here. Mr. Pullen, the boiler maker, the Hal Pullen, yeah. he didn't move. Yeah. He came, you know, came back and forth and Off. Uh, well, Parsons, you know, never moved his family, and I don't think he went up there for a while because he didn't have much seniority when I was up there. They, a lot of the younger guys were older than him. Yes, sir. But in the year that I worked at Paducah, which was 40 and 41, Parsons and Clint Wood, Dwight Davidson, and, and old Hall Pullen and I were the five that, that left there every Saturday night. Now, some of the other others would come once in a while, and there was a couple of Negroes out here. Will, uh, old... James, what's his name, the old young His daddy would come down. James Bland? Yeah, Will Bland. Will Bland. Uh, some others would come pretty frequently, but man, they didn't even run, run that train unless Parsons and Clint Woods and Dwight Davidson and me was on. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Parsons and Clint Woods kept it up for 20 years. I see. Oh, man, every weekend. But most of them took their families and went on up there. But do you know that this very week, looking through a 1925 paper, 25. Yes, sir. There's a big article right here in the Herald, a big railroad shop being built at Paducah, Kentucky. Well, the people didn't know it, but that was the handwriting on the wall right there. That's right. Now, Mr. Markham had the best of intentions, but see, Mr. Markham just worked for the board of directors for the railroad company. What they told him to do was what he did. That's right. So when, when there, statisticians and their officials got together and decided that they could do most of this this renovation work, this repair work, in one big shop. And you know when they built it, it was the most modern shop in the world, railroad shop. That Paducah Yeah, shop. it was a, and it was the biggest one in the country. I it remember. was a, the biggest one up to that time and the most modern was at Altoona, Pennsylvania. That's right, that's right. 
because the Pennsylvania Railroad has a tremendous shop with Altoona. Yes, sir. But do you know that this thing of this thing of the shop staying or leaving was bothering this town way back before you could even remember? Because the other day I I have fallen heir to quite a few old papers, and I'm in I'm in some 1916 papers, Paul, and here is an expression of concern for several weeks in the paper about the shop. And then here comes another article that says, President Markham, big, big article, see, President Markham assures water value the shop will not leave. That's right. And what happened? Several of the local merchants and the editor of the paper were allowed to get on his private car here one morning on number six and interview him all the way to Holly Springs. And that man wrote them a letter, and it's in the paper. And it says that he, or the Illinois Central Management, at, did not contemplate the removal of the Water Valley shop under any circumstances. No plans were being made. Well, in 1916, there weren't any plans being yes, made. Sir. And he, he was sure of himself enough, well, you know, of... Uh, uh, an executive officer of a company wouldn't even do that nowadays, you know, yes, because somebody would sue them. That's right. But he did. He wrote them a letter and signed it. They got off the train in Holly Springs and came back to Water Valley and put the letter in the paper to assure this town that the shop was going to stay. That's right. And don't you know that was a happy town? That, yes, sir. That one, well, yeah. Because well, yes, a lot of rumors had been floating up. Uh, you know how rumors get started on the railroad. You heard a million of them. Oh, yes, and what we call a sun house stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I can never forget uh, Chester Bell and uh, were breaking on here and old Fred Champion, and I would be fired for Fred Tracy. And, of course, Chester Bell and Fred Champion jawed at each other all the time. And, and every time somebody would say something about going to change the job or pull it off. Old Chester would say, well, now, y'all better shut up. Says, if the train master ever hears of that, he'll sit down and figure out that that uh, he can pull that thing off and says he'll pull it off. That's right. Said, if you start talking, pulling the job off or changing it, you can just bet it's going to happen. That's right. He's right there. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was talking positive, and, and people said it, they talked that chop way. Possibly that concern in 1916 was precipitated by the removal of these banana trains from over here in 1914. That's just about what just happened. About, uh, That's right. uh, what happened there. One another thing that, that happened that you lied. <coughs> there came such a terrible flood in this town. On the, it's in the paper on the 22nd of July, the week of that 22nd of July. There came a terrible flood, washed all the stores, got in the store, got in the shop. And uh, there's a great deal of being said in the paper. The editor of the paper, Mr. Barber, says that if the city fathers don't do something about that creek and, and go on and dig this channel down here and get that creek going down east of the railroad like they've been talking about, they're going to have a mass meeting and force them. Well, you know, the shop, it's expensive to clean that shop out. And, and then uh, I don't know that the trains quit running that time, but it wasn't but three years, Paul, till that same thing happened again. Now, you've told me about that big flood. Well, I, I remember March of 19, 19? 19, March of 17th, 1917. That's exactly right, because I found it in the paper. And you're exactly right. And that was the worst one that ever happened. It got up in the powerhouse. Now, they had a washout somewhere between him and Grenada, and 23 would come down, like yeah. they usually did, and go to the washout, and they, I don't know how they exchanged mail and passengers and baggage. And then each train, one would back up to Grenada, turn around, and this yeah. one would back up here and turn around and go back as 24. See? It said for, for four days, I believe, That's right. the train service was interrupted. And not only that, they had to clean six inches of mud out of the shop. They had to drain the turntable. They had to drain the pits in the machine shop. That's Everything right. was full of water. That's right. And then, I'm sure that's, 
I have some pictures up there showing mud and everything all in the shops. Then I have another picture that somebody gave me in that same group of pictures, and it shows a long train of flat cars with hundreds of men shoveling dirt off on that creek bank up there making a levy. And I know what they did. They cleaned that mud out of the shop and took a switch engine back to those cars up there. And, and did it show that little old engine, 115 pull? No, it didn't show the engine. Didn't it show I remember the, the number of that engine. They used one, it was number 115 that, you know, pulled yeah. Papa worked up there in the car shop and for several days or a week or more. Well, they just worked cleaning up. That's all the work they did, you know. Yeah. I remember that rain on the night. There's a Sunday night on March That's 17, what it said, 1917. Night. I remember it just like it's last night. It said it came one huge rain, and then it quit, and it says here came another cloud, and it just got twice as much again. Yes, sir, that's right. It was just and a And it must have rained 10 inches. Man, yes, sir, it was. Of course, I wasn't but uh, six years old. I wasn't six years old. I wouldn't have been six till June, but I was, I was five years old, but I remember it. And those engines just entranced me. I mean, and I kept up with the numbers of those engines and yeah. who ran them. And, and well, you put, told me one time that Mr. Dunn's engine was a 1039, I believe. Yes, sir, that's right. And who, what was Mr. Boydston's engine? It was a 10, uh, I, don't, I don't remember here, I mean, what the number of his engine was. Mr. Dunn and Mr. Ruffin and Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Dunn ran the 1039, Mr. Ruffin ran the 1059, and Mr. Archie Smith ran the 1037. And why they they sent the 1039 and the 1037 away from here and brought the 1038 and the 1056 here. And I don't know why they switched them around. I've got a picture of the 1056 made on 23 here. But man, that was 1938. That was a long time after that. Yes, sir. 1056 is here in 1921 because on March 12, 1921, which was a Saturday, uh, Mr. Dr. Smith is coming down on 23, and he struck Pete Shepard in, in a uh, Buick touring car there on Fulmer's Crossing, and uh, Mr. It knocked him over the smokestack of the engine and 180 feet away from the crossing. Of course, he didn't know that Pete You died. mean his body went that far? His body went that far. See, they, that, that train came around that curve there, and, and they was, they was balling the jack, and, and, uh, it, and the train stopped and backed up, but the, the, the engine stopped about opposite the station there, that, the power plant had shot. Oh, yeah. And, and he was coming from the north then. Yes, he's coming south. He was coming from out Mr. Ashford, wasn't he? Yes, sir, he's coming. He had carried Ruth on, Ruth Ashford, yeah. and uh, and she just raised Cain and got mad at her mother because she, her mother wouldn't let her come back with it, with him. And when he got back over, the, he had raced that train uh, time after time, but that particular day the thing died on the track. And Mr. Eric McGonagall uh, saw it happen, and he said that it looked like he was under the, bent over under, trying to do something under the dashboard, and that train hit him. Good, great. And say so that was Mr. Archer Smith? At, yes, sir, Mr. Anyway. Archer Smith. And it was 1921. Well, now, his his father was a railroad man, wasn't he? Shepard? Uh, you never didn't know his father? No, sir, I never did. His father was Joe Shepard. Oh, uh, uh, no, sir, I never did know him. I think he was an engineer or something. Yeah, that's right. Yes, sir. And his mother was an old angler, wasn't she? Yes, sir. Well, you know, that's right. I can. J.D. Olinger's. That's grandson. right. Uh, I can just remember probably Mr. Bob Ward saying that, you know, how the old men like him remembered who was who. Said that they didn't like that marriage at all because Shepard wasn't from the right side of the track or something like yes, that. Yes, sir. He know. told me that. Did he? Yes, he told me that. See, Mr. Ward remembered all of that business about families. Yes, sir. And, you, and, and he just. He had a wonderful memory, like you. His his memory for dates was not as acute as yours. But uh, well, Mr. Boston retired in '22, so you wouldn't hardly remember his number. No, sir. I, um, 
I remember Mr. John Moorhead used to run the 10 off 6, and he later ran the 11 off 2. And Mr. Greer was in that bunch too, Mr. wasn't he? Yes, sir. When I, Mr. Greer used to run the 1032. Uh, 1032. Yes, sir. But Mr. Hammond had already gone to Memphis by the time yes. you can remember. That's right. And Mr. Harry Williams was gone. Yes, sir. And, I know uh, Mr. Harry. Do you? Yes, sir. What? He had, you know, his wife was buried up in Oak Hill Cemetery, but, but he was leaving. He had a boy, I believe, named Sidney. And uh, I hadn't heard of Sidney since he left. I think he probably in Memphis, you see, 15 years ago or so, I went up one day and visited Uncle Willis and his second wife. Yes, sir. And uh, they took me around to where Mr. Williams was living. I said he had married again. He had a real fine Christian woman who was younger than him, and he was paralyzed there in that bed, and she was taking care of him. And he laid there and talked to me, and I had so many things I wanted to ask him, but he couldn't answer them. He was, his throat was affected. I did get from him how he lost his leg. Nobody seemed to know. He was fined for Charlie Hammond on number three, and they turned over north of Holly Springs, three miles. When the engine stopped, it was 67 feet from the right of way. And that's uh, I, I all I, he just whispered that, you see. Yes, sir. And his. I just imagine that his leg was crushed and they probably got some farmer to take him into town and cut it off. And he didn't die. That's Lots right. of times people died with amputations. That's right. He but, didn't uh, say what the number of the engine was, did he? No, he didn't, but it was one of those little 900. I see. It was either a 900 or 1100. They had some little bits of engines, 1127, 1156, 1119. I've got a picture of the 1156 and the 1127. Little bitty engines with two great big drivers on each side. Yes, sir. And they wouldn't pull but five or six of those little coaches, you know. That's they weren't right. very strong engines. And in fact, I've got a train sheet up there at the house with Casey Jones coming in here on the afternoon of December the 23rd, 1893, on the 1127 on number four. See, one, two, three, and four came through Water Valley. They didn't go through Memphis. That's right. The big passenger train came through this town until the 30th day of June, 1896. And on the afternoon of the 30th of June, uh, a Water Valley engineer, Pete Olson, was a fireman, a nigger fireman named Tansy Baker. They took number four to Memphis up the Grenada District for the first time on engine 935, because I got a picture of it. Mr. Croom, an old man named Croom, Joel Croom, had a, a great number of pictures when he died, or his son at Paducah had a bunch of pictures, and somebody sent them to me, and that was one of those pictures. Well, Do you I remember said, Mr. Croom? Yes, sir. Yes, I remember. He lived on this street somewhere. He lived up there where? Uh, Jack Craven lives. Oh, they okay. own, that's an old Croom place. Oh. And his sister was Mr. Herbie Howell's mother. And Mr. I didn't know that. Yes, sir. And Mr. Walter Croom worked in the railroad shops here. I guess till they moved him, and I don't think he went to Memphis. I think he was, went to Hattiesburg or somewhere south. Uh, and look at this thing. It won't work. Yes, sir. Uh, well, now, I, I remember seeing in an old paper one time, Mr. Croom was quite a respected citizen. He was on the board here in the city at one time. Yes, sir. He was a board member. Anyway, either he or his son had had been cutting pictures out of newspapers and out of IC magazines and framing them. And I got a great stack of those things. And I just sent one off the other day, to, and, and when it comes, I'm going to bring it and show it to you. It's a group of machinists and shop men taken in 1900 up there in the shop, and Mr. Croom had put all the names on them. Strolene, Joe Strolene and his son Henning, Mr. Miller Ryder, uh, all those old men, Clint Woods, Owen Woods, uh, 
Was that the same Mac- I think so. Johnson's and, you know. Yeah, all that Martin's old bunch. And all, like that. all that old bunch. And uh, I did. I don't think I brought it. I, I grabbed it up and started to bring it. No, that's the only picture I brought. Oh, that's a picture made inside the master mechanic's office up there. Well, I only class. And I don't know the people. I don't know one of them. And I got my magnifying glass and looked at the date. You see, they got the engines listed over there on that board. Yes, sir. And it's 1918. Well, I don't say. And uh, I'm sure that's inside the master mechanic's office at the shop. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I remember. Uh, that 1918, you know, they had a manifest train, 51 and 52 through here. Yeah, and, uh, that train was running here back in the 90s. Uh, that, yeah, it was a hot shot way back then. That's it, kind of like a 75 was later. Yeah, mm. and 51 and 52 were the fast ones, 84 and 72 going north with the drags because I've got some train sheets, Paul, with three and four sections of 84 and three and four sections of 72. Of course, some of them would be bananas. Yes, sir. This is back in the 1890s. Yes, sir. I've got, got train sheets in the 90s. I've got some in 1901, 1904, 1907. And then I, what happened, you see, when we moved all this stuff out of the depot yes, down sir. here, they put it in the basement at Grenada. They boxed all those old, old train sheets from 1900 to 1946 and all the messages and everything, boxed them up and put them in the basement at Grenada. Well, Aubrey Travis, you remember Aubrey? Yes, sir, I remember him well. Aubrey was working there. I said one day, I said, Aubrey, my daddy was, made his first trip as an engineer sometime in May 1930. He said, I find it. So he went down there and found it. He found the 1930 box, and he didn't he didn't find the sheet. He says, "You come down here Sunday afternoon with a hammer and a crowbar, and says we'll get in that box." So I went down there, and he slipped me in through the depot, and we got down there, and we found that train sheet. Daddy went out here on the 2446 Cap Garden firing for him, pulling Vert Johnson on an empty strawberry train going to camp. So I waited a few days to be sure nothing, nobody would hear about it. Then I went to see the train master, Mr. Beach. But what I didn't know was that Daddy and Mr. Beach was having bad trouble. And Mr. Beach was threatening to fire him. And Daddy was threatening to whoop him. <laughs> Taylor Howard just told, told me all this stuff lately. They, they had a little place at the tie plant where they'd go in and eat supper and I think they maybe played a little cards or something and you know how those jobs are you do the same thing every day it gets boring so the fireman would go in and he'd eat and play cards a while and the other guy would run the engine and fire it too yes sir then they'd swap up <laughs> well Beach went out there and he found out about it and man he got so mad he got to following that switch engine around, and one day, if Daddy ever got on overtime, he just mean enough to going back to town from the tie plant. He'd just ease along, slow, you know, make a little more overtime. <laughs> so Beach came along, and he signaled him to hurry up, you know. And Daddy never did even move. I mean, he didn't go a bit faster. When he got uptown, Beach got all over him about it, or tried to. And he said, didn't you see me motioning for you to, to increase your speed? He said, I said I can't take signals from somebody driving by the railroad in the car. He said, you might have been an ignorant nigger going up there waving at me. He said, I didn't know who you were. <laughs> Made him so mad. It's a wonder your father had not whipped him. He, uh, well, anyway. Your father's a very kind man and a close friend of mine, but. He I didn't take no food. He didn't take any. See, Beach. Beach got to be a, a colonel, you see, in the war. And he tried to run the railroad like a military camp. Yes, sir. Well, anyway, 
When I went to ask Mr. Beach if I could get that train sheet, he almost spit on me. He did. He says, no, sir, you can't. I wanted to take it up to the courthouse, have a Xerox copy made, and bring it back. It wasn't any good to them down there in the basement. This was way up in the 50s. Oh, I got so mad. And old August says, well, sir, says, you know where it is now. If anything happens to it, I don't know anything about it. So I've got it up there at the house. Not only that, after Beach left and two or three more train masters came and went, everybody forgot about those train sheets except me. <laughs> so I started, when I would be running the switch engine at night, when we had some time waiting on the Panama, I'd go downstairs and I would start digging through those things. And I found all kind of things, like when Mr. Everett wrecked down here at the ice plant. I found where these Powell boys, uh, where their granddaddy got killed at Middleburg, Mr. Hathaway, Miss Topps' daddy. I sent the train sheet to those boys. I found a, a lot of interesting sheets and I gave them to people if the, some of their family were involved. Yes, sir. And then other people began to get into them. What everybody was looking for was the Casey Jones sheets, you see. Yes, sir. Everybody wanted the one he had his wreck on. Well, as far as I know, it wasn't down there. It might have been in what they threw out of the depot down here in 55. I was able to save some of that. I didn't know they were hauling to the garbage dump. I didn't know it. That was an office thing. The way the railroad company threw those records away. I heard about it about two days after they started, and I went down there one night, and I got the whole back of my pickup full of train orders and messages in the 1890s, and I got stacks and stacks of train sheets, and I got to look at them, and I found Casey Jones on 92 sheets. And I put them up there in my museum, and for a long time, I didn't say anything to anybody because you realize what a find that was, man. Oh, man. Yeah. There's the real Casey Jones running between him and Kent. Finally, I, I put an ad in Trains Magazine in New York, Milwaukee. And uh, I sold a, a lot of them to museums. And to, oh, I sold some to members of the New York Stock Exchange, to doctors. I sold one to a fellow who used to be here who was the vice president of some company up in New York. And he was from one of us. Anyway, I sold about 50 of them. I gave a lot of them away to old railroaders, and I've got about 10 of them left. Okay. But anyway, that's how I got, really how I started my collection. But you were going to tell me of, about the smokestack for it, and I yes, don't want to miss that. On uh, this particular day, I don't recall the day of the week, and the reason that I have uh, authenticated uh, information, I conducted Tommy Ashford's mother's funeral that day. And it was a bad, cold, rainy day, and that was the 19th day of February 1937. 37. And, and, uh, I know when we came, when I came back in from the funeral, I looked down toward the shop, and that old stack was down, and it looked real barren. Yeah. And they tore down all those old buildings about that same time. I, they must have wrecked them all because they'd already taken the windows out, and, and at the same time they tore the stationary building, powerhouse building down up there. And I guess they cut up those old boilers for scrap. And, uh, well, I never didn't know where the powerhouse building was. Was it north of the Master Mechanics yes, Office? Yes, sir. Right directly north of the Master Mechanics Office. And it was right opposite the boiler shop, the old boiler shop. Well, now, where was the paint shop? The paint shop was right across. It was, uh, well, i say 15 or 20 foot uh, walkway driveway between the north end of the boiler shop and, and the paint shop. I see. And the tank shop was a, the foundry, the paint shop, and the tank shop was all there together. In the land. Huh? Yes, sir. And, uh, but they was not, uh, they was frame building, his frame building, and 
the boiler shop and the machine shop building was a brick. Did you ever hear your father speak about the time the shop burned? Yes, sir. I, I, well, I didn't hear him talk about it because he wasn't here then. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I've heard the others say it burned in 1890. And I believe a Mr. Carlson lost his life in that. That's exactly right. His name was Andy Carlson. Yes, sir. Was the father of the Carlson that uh, took his life up there before his family moved to Paducah, you know? Yes, sir. Can't remember his name. Mr. Albert Carlson. Albert Carlson. The girl was named Alberta, right? Alberta. There was, I knew him at Paducah, see. He killed himself the 17th day of February 1930 in Paducah. But oh, and I thought it was here. No, was sir. He, no, sir. He had moved to Paducah. Oh. And, and uh, he killed himself. But he was, let's see, now you're right because he was boarded. He must have lived. I know he lived that because they brought him back here for bail and in, in between the time of arrival of the body and the funeral at the First Baptist Church, it was his body was at Mr. Ed Holly's right there, you know, where Carl White lived on the corner. Central Street, right? First House North of Mr. Yeah, Taylor yeah. Howard. Well, that wasn't their old home, though, was it? There no, was so he was just a friend. Mr. Holly and he were friends, and, and they just told him to bring the body there, I think. The Carlson home was across the street, wasn't it? Yes, sir, it sure was. The Carlson home was across the street. Which one of those houses was it now? I have somebody has told me. Which... Uh, that where, where uh, Ms. Uh, uh, the crippled man got Crowell. Killed. Wow. That, that's the, the house, I think. That's what I thought, yeah. That was the call. And home. the next one to it was the, what was known to us as the J.G. Scooksburg house, and he was chief clerk to the superintendent. Yeah, that's right. I got a picture of him somewhere. And a mighty fine man. He was a, a bachelor, wasn't he? Yes, sir. I see. Yes, sir, he was a bachelor. Okay. Then he was a member of the Christian church, and when he, he died of TB. And he did. Uh, Yes, sir. Well, so did that that man Edwards. Annabelle Edwards' husband died with TB, too, didn't he? Yes, sir. Yeah. You know, I didn't know Annabelle was dead until she'd been dead quite some time. I didn't know she had died. Yes, sir. She died. When she retired from the railroad, she became a uh, newspaper reporter for some Fulton, Kentucky paper. And she died, and of course, they carried her back to Macomb and buried, buried her. Uh, her beside her husband because they buried him at the corner. Well, I didn't know that. I, f I found his death in a, one of the paper, or the IC magazines up there. Wore glasses, worked down here in the depot. Yes, sir. But, uh... He was, a, he was an engineer, I think. You yeah, know, in the engineer's engineer. office, yeah. Yes, well, what about Miss Topsy? Is she still living? No, sir. I buried Miss Topsy when... When I was up there, before I left up there. You did? I yes, sir. That. Yes, sir. I buried Miss Topsy before I left. I know her sons came. Yeah. Whatever went to Ken, Mr. Powell. He's still living. He is. Down in Jackson, Mississippi. Last time I heard he was. He just that, walked off and left. That her. was the strangest thing. I, You know, we thought that was a happy union. Yes, sir. And he was a well liked fellow. He sure was. He was a very popular dispatcher. He didn't rawhide anybody, and he'd help, he'd help an engineer and conductor get over the road better than anybody else. I never will forget the morning that Turner and Louis Vines went to Jackson, Tennessee with a strawberry train in two hours and 20 minutes. Nobody had ever been up there on one of those mics that fast, you know. That's right. They didn't have but about 18 or 20 cars. And somebody said, well, see, he's Turner's Powell's brother-in-law. Yes, sir. So he said, old Powell just turned him loose. That's the expression for just let him run as fast as he wanted to. But I don't imagine it did. Turner wasn't any great, any great speed as an engineer. He just had a light train and a good engine. They had the 1392. I never forget that. 1392. And uh, Louis Vines was fine for him. Louis Vines later transferred to the... Birmingham, Birmingham district. district, and he, he went off his rocker, you know. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. 
Because he had a wreck been in some Oh, he, he, he did that. That happened to him way back before the steam ever went away, he, 20 years ago. Uh, he, I, I don't know, they call it depression now, I guess. Yes, I worked with him over there in 1943. You did? I worked at Hale. I didn't I know that. Uh, and I guess they've done away with that shop over there, little shop. Yeah, I'm sure that they're still... They've still got some kind of a force there, though, Paul, because they're still running a lot of big tra trains down to Birmingham. Yes, sir. But you, you wouldn't believe it at Jackson, Tennessee. There's absolutely nothing. There's a little old lumber mill over there where the shop used to be, and the engines come and go at Jackson. I don't guess you can even get one fuel up there now. No sand, no fuel. Before I ever quit, you'd come down that night to come out on 41s, and the engines would be sitting over there. Nobody around them, nothing. If you needed anything, the closest place it was was Memphis or Florida. Nothing. Nobody came in to see you <coughs> off or see if you need anything, and it just deserted. Did they still, did I see still retain that gym and those shops over there? Oh, yeah, that's, that's what they're going to do at Jackson. They're going to eventually put everything over to GM and O. And would you believe what the, what else they've done? In the, in the merger agreement, the engineers on the GM&O and the engineers on these districts, the Water Valley and Bonita District, had a merger agreement. And the thing has wound up now to where the GM&O has got two of the three piggyback trains out of Memphis. They got engineers on them. They're not Water Valley or Bonita District men. They're Jim and old men. They're afraid they're going to take the Panama away from them. They had the, the agreement was on through freights. Well, what they did, that smart bunch of Jackson on the Jim and O, they pulled that through freights off. So they said, well, we haven't gotten it through freights. We're going to have to come over here and get on some of you. So they came over and they took one piggyback. Now they got two. You mean that, uh, that uh, I see is going to run there? They uh, stepped out of Jackson, through Jackson, down the gym. Uh, uh, uh. Well, they still do, but they're just letting it. They're letting that old gym and old just rot down, and got nothing now but local freight. And these men at Jackson, in that merger agreement, if they pull one of their through freights off over there, they can come over and roll the water out of man off of the job out of Memphis. So now, two of the piggyback trains are from Memphis to Canton are being run by Jim and O engineers out of Jackson, Tennessee. And these boys here are so mad they're trying to have a lawsuit over it. Old Chapman Pullen and Baxter Jones and some of them, you know, are trying to get some evidence why. But they can't. It's in the agreement. And what happened, they, their superintendent declared all of their through freights to be local freights. And so he messed them up. I mean, he fixed them where they can come over and get these jobs. Mm -hmm. And you can't blame them. No, sir, that's right. Well, let's see now. I wanted to ask you this. You went to Arkansas to school, and you how, did you go one or two years over there? How right, long? One year at Arkansas College and one year at the university. Yeah, that's right. You went a year up here. Yes, sir. And then you went into into the ministry, or did you work? I was working in, the, I'd surrounded preaching in yeah. the grade in high school, so, mm -hmm. and that depression came on, and, and uh, times were so hard, I just couldn't go back. Yeah, I, I can understand. You know, I had to understand that. Well, how, uh, where did you work when you came back? Did you just work here? Just wherever where I could. Yes. Yeah. Then during the war, you worked somewhere with Haleville. Yes, sir, that's right. Yeah. I worked at Bolivus, Tennessee, three days. And I came back down here to quit, go to work down at Camp McCann uh, yeah. Air Force. And I told Mr. Evans, you know, Dr. Evans, his father, his yeah. chief clerk, superintendent. And I said, if this is all, Mr. Evans, this is all you got to me, Bob, the Tennessee. I said, um, I just, just figure up my time. You and couldn't. He wouldn't let me quit. He, he sent me over to Hale. You couldn't pay board up there and. and Work that job away from home no, and make any money. No, sir, we wasn't making any money. Yeah. And Mr. Mr. Williams had, uh, had an operator there, you know, that took over the 
how to write a word. Mm -hmm. Of course, he copied the orders and the clerk's part and everything. In fact, his, he just, this man did all the work, but he'd been in a job at Red Bay, Alabama, and got it. And so I went up there, and I didn't know anything. And, and so I wasn't, Doc uh, Cooper had given me a, a shot for smallpox, and that thing had, had begun to take effect, and I had fever. And so I told him, I said, Mr. Williams, I'm, on, I'm going to uh, catch 41 tomorrow night, and I'm going home, and I'm going to quit. But he, cut, he got in touch with Mr. Evans, uh, and Mr. Evans, uh, was oh, yeah. my intentions, you know. And I know he did. He wanted me to stay on up house. I don't know anything about this up there. And I brought to work mostly in the yard. Bless your heart, Juan. He, uh, they sent me to hell. Then I bid in a taking job at Grenada. On the day, I arrived at Hale on the day, January 18, 1943, that Mr. Jim Mathis got killed out here on 32 Highway, you know. And, uh, Jim Mathis. Oh, Mr. yeah. An oil truck or something turned over out there, you know. Yeah. <coughs> I thought that happened after the war. No, sir, it was January 18, 1943. I know what happened. Mama sent me the clipping out of the paper. That's what I see. I was up in Alaska. Yes, sir. And, uh, man, that was a terrible thing. Well, those uh, trains up there in Alaska, I guess they look like the, there's 50 years behind us, wasn't They really were, yeah. The Alaska Railroad, run by the government, just had old scrappy engines and scrappy cars, just they were real mad about it. They just got what was left over that the government bought down here in the States and sent to them. Of course, nowadays it's a fine railroad. But man, it was a junk pile then. We got off the boat there at Seward one night, late one afternoon, went over and got on the train. Seward, Alaska is down on the Gulf of Alaska. Yes. We had come from Seattle by boat. We all got on that train, hundreds of us, with two engines on it to go to Anchorage, wasn't 120 miles away. We took off up toward that hill, that mountain that you have to climb. Been snowing all day, and those two engines wouldn't go through that pass, it was too much snow. So we backed back down, and we started through it again. Up and down about five or six times, and finally they gave up. We had to sleep on that stinking hot train all night. They got the steam up enough to get us warm and go over to the coast artillery and eat our food. Then the next day, the snowplow finally got through, and we got to Anchorage about 18 hours later. That 120 miles took 18 hours. Wow, that's I'm telling you, that was off of railroad I was saw. It's a beautiful trip if everything is going right. So yes, sir. Beautiful mountain and river. But that, that was a real... They brought them down there and run them through the Duke of Shock. Wow. They'd, they'd put them up there, they'd climb the And push the mountain down. That's right. <laughs> I've got so many pretty pictures. I would slip out the back door there, back there where Uncle Bud Fly worked at that big wheel lathe. Uh, I spent several months as a apprentice to the man who put the stokers in the engine. Yes, sir. And it wouldn't take us but half a day to put one in, and they had an engine. Well, it was three or four days between the engines, and we'd have a good bit of spare time. So I took my camera over there, and I'd go out the back door, and then have put that pretty brand new engine backed out of the shop, waiting for them to come from the roundhouse and fire it up and take it away, you know. Yes, sir. And I got pictures of the 24, 56, and the 48, and a bunch of mics, 8,000 and things, as they brought them out of the shop. Yes, sir. And they were pretty. Did did they cut up any of those ten hundreds while he was up there? Mm -hmm. No, they started taking the ten hundred and making twenty hundreds out of them. Yes, sir. Lowering the diameter of the wheels, yes, changing them around. But the little engines, they were going to use them in local freight service, but they were slippery. They wouldn't hold the rail. They, they would slip. They had one here during the war. 
a rider engine that the crews went to Grenada and got on the troop train. Yes, sir. Had a little old 2000 here all during the war. Because I found some time slips where Daddy, Daddy fired on the thing a lot during the war for fellas like Ringgold and Buckley. Yes, sir. And all those fellas. Let's see, I want, it was one of those old engineers I wanted. Did you, do you remember Mr. Ham, an engineer named Ham? No, sir, he was, he died in 1916, and that was, yeah, when I was five years old, I heard of him after I grew up, but I didn't, I didn't remember, you know. Well, I keep seeing something in the papers up in the 20s about Mrs. M. V. Ham, like she might have still been she, living. She lived on, yes, until several years after his death. Yeah. I think she died in the 1930s, I, I would believe. Mr. Ward buried her, I think. Well, another fellow died in 1915 or 16. He died in the Chicago hospital, and his name was Frank Newell, wasn't it? You ever see anything on yes, his? Yes, sir. He, he's buried up there. Yeah, Frank Newell. Yes, sir. He was engineer. That's right. Then I found the other day in the in the paper where Jack Kirby died, the postmaster. Yes, he died in 1927. He, he and Red there. Myers died the same year, and the other one were there were three buddies back when they were young firemen. I got in the old books up there. They always came to the lodge meeting together. They were buddies. Yes, sir. And Casey Jones was their buddy, and uh, they all died the same year. And that they, all three of them were atheists, is what they told me. Yes, sir. Now, I don't know about Mr. Kirby, but when they were young, they were atheists. That's what a, a real old lady told me. I don't know whether it was Mrs. Greer or somebody says it and says, uh, says you know, the, the Lord took them all away the same year. Jay Boone was scalded to death over in the Birmingham district, and Red Myers died up here at Mrs. And uh, he was running the switch engine on May the 6th, 1927, engine number 570. Norman Mestre was firing for him. They're spotting the car up to the storeroom right north of Master Mechanic's office. Mr. W. Johns got a drink of water at a fountain there and was looking intently toward the south of the, down the rip track south. And they was behind him. The bell was ringing, and, and that uh, engine struck him and ran over him and killed him. Good night. And Mr. Red Myers was engineer, and, uh, and, and about six months he was found dead in bed. Stan Oak Brown found him. Went up there to call him for the yeah. local, I believe, mm -hmm. the switch engine was on. He was on the local end, I think. Well, I didn't know how Mr. Johns got killed. Now, he was the father of uh, Effie and... Effie Word. Effie Word and... Uh, That's right. And, uh, Candy Johns. Who was Candy Johns? Candy Johns was August Johns, and, and he married uh, Roy, Roy Rogers' wife. Yeah, Dale Evans. Dale Evans. And she came here a time or two, didn't she? I don't know if so she could have. Yeah, she came here and visited the Henry Stewart's. She was a friend to Louise Stewart. Isn't that her name, Louise? Yes, sir. I forget who it was told me about going to their house one time, and she was there. And I think that they that she they have been in contact <coughs> since then, to some extent. Well, is Miss Effie Word still living? I was going to ask you. I, I wouldn't think so, because she was a, as old or older than uh, Annabelle and those... Uh, that's right. Well, uh, if she's dead, she's buried at Coffeeville. And I'm going down there sometime and see if I can find her grave. Wasn't she a good-looking gal when yes, she was young? she was. She married one of the Hawkins boys, you know, and he died of flu and pneumonia in 1918. That Vesta, old bad flu one. Yes, sir. Vesta and Vesta died within 10 days of each other, I think. Two brothers? Yes, sir. And they're from Grenada? Nothing. I mean, uh, Coffeeville. No, sir, they was from, they was from here, but uh, Mr. Word, uh, Miss Effie's second husband, was buried at Coffee. Oh, I see, Fred. Yes, sir. So why was, was 
Fred had been buried down there. Well, he'd I, been buried down there a long time. I thought he would have been here. Yes, sir, but they didn't. Uh, they carried him to Coffeyville. First thing I remember about Fred Word when I was just a kid, I heard him talking about did you hear that Fred Word went to Caulfield yesterday in 13 minutes? He had a Chrysler 72. <laughs> or one of those fast Chryslers, you know. Yes, when a guy would get a new car, you know, he'd have to take it down and try it out on that piece of straight track down there, the yes, Wagner sir, Stretch. Wagner stretch yes, but they said Fred Word went to Caulfield in 13 minutes in that Chrysler. Yeah, and of course, us kids, of course, oh, you're going to go Fred Word. And later on, he was driving this old Buick that went up and down the track that carried the yes, superintendent sir. and track inspector. He was a good old fella. I never did know Harkham, of course. But Effie had a daughter, Jewel. Jewel, who married somebody, and then she married Paul William. And boy, she was a handsome girl, too. Yes, sir. She lives she in was, Jackson, Tennessee now. She was a plain beauty. Yes, sir. Well, who was their mother? Who was Mr. John's wife? A Pate? A Tate or something like that? I don't know, sir, who she was. I, I, I believe, you know, there's an old Tate home up yonder where that nigger park is now. Oh. Yeah, that Paul Tate. Now, he was Mr. Jim Tate's son and Mr. Mabel Howell's brother. And uh, <coughs> he had another brother named Raymond Tate. His, he was the youngest one. And, uh, well, I believe Mrs. I believe Mrs. John must have been a Tate. Or uh, either Mrs. John and Mrs. Tate were sisters. There was some kinship there. Yes, sir. I don't know what it was. But what was Mr. John at the shop? Was he, he a, was a car repair. Car repair. Yes, sir. Well, they said that, that noon that day he smoked the pipe and his wife didn't believe him and didn't want him to smoke and said that they got in an argument. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it was whispered around the shop, they thought it was just actual suicide. Oh, my. A lot of that happened, you know. That's right. You know, it hadn't been but just a few years ago that you had several brothers down there on the Louisiana Division. We used to connect up with them in Canton. Their names were Penn, P-E-N-N. -N. One of them, a couple of them were engineers, a couple of them conductors. Fine gentlemen, I mean clean and no drinking, no vulgarity, none of that stuff. But if one of them finally had to quit the engineer. And he, he had to live with his daughter. And they didn't get along very well. One night, Panama coming north out of Macomb, or one of the passenger trains, they saw something on the track right up there, just at the north, north of Macomb up there. And he had gone down and just kneeled over with his head up, out over the rail. Killed him. Yes, uh, a lot of the old railroaders, man, when they quit, they had worked so long, Paul, that they didn't have any hobby. They, they, they had gotten away from their church, maybe, and they, they weren't, they, they weren't, they didn't belong anywhere, see. They belonged on the railroad. That's right. And when they separated, they died. That's right. Uh, a few of them had hobbies, but most of them just kind of pined their life away after that. Do you know whether they still have a shop in Macomb? They do, yeah. They've had a large car repair program going on down there for years. Macomb is still pretty strong shop-wise, I think. I see. And they're still running a lot of trains. Of course, there's a lot of freight business now. If they had the freight business they got now and divided up in little 20 and 30 car trains like when you were young, yes, sir. There'd, be, there'd be many trains of them every day, but they put 150 cars in one train. That's right. Call them down that valley. But all that stuff, of course, goes through Jackson, Mississippi. Yes, sir. And then down the double track to New Orleans. And so O.J. E. Hale is running a switch engine in the Macomb Yard right now. And then... Uh, his nephew, Mike Hale, is, is breaking, I believe. I didn't know what Mike was. Yes, sir. Mike's breaking. I want to ask you about somebody now. Already I thought of something. Mrs. Rogers 
One of the Dunn girls was a Roger. Yes, sir. Is she still living? I, I, as far as I know, she is because her husband's buried up here, and they she died at Tyler Town, Mississippi, and they brought him over to the St. Mary Methodist Church at Macomb, and had the service one morning, and they brought him up here, and they got me for the committal service and benediction, and because now that was Olin Anderson. Now, sir, that was, uh, this was Mr. Rogers. Oh, Mr. Rogers. Olin Anderson was buried here. He, yeah. he died at Tower Town, too. But I, you see, oh. Miss Ella Clyde Dunn, Ms. Olin Anderson, taught me in the Sunday school. I went to the Methodist church for yeah. a little while, and she and she knew me ever since I was knee high about that. And I said the committal service without the matter book, or, and then a little poet, and now the laborer's task is over. Now the battle day is past. Now upon the farther shore the lands of Borgia at last. And uh, then had the benedic prayer and benediction. And, and that impressed them because they didn't use a book. Or something. Yeah. And uh, uh, Miss Ella Klein died, and then Mr. Olin, they brought her back up here. And Mr. Olin died, and they brought him back up here. But Ms. Rogers, as far as I know, is still living, but she must be very, very. Hey, she'd have to be 90, wouldn't she, Father? Yes, sir. She'd have to be 90. Now she's Eva May, isn't she? Yes, sir. That's Eva right. May and Ella Clyde. The, the last day mm -hmm. that Mr. Dunn ran the train and he quit, uh, Ms. Dunn was up at the hospital, and she heard him whistling for town. She said, that comes Charlie. Well, she died before he got to the depot. And he came down on engine number 1114 that day. And one day in 1945, I asked him, I said, uh, Mr. Dunn, what was a, uh, the number of the last engine that you ran? He said, the 1189, but it wasn't. It was 1114, but he's, I didn't say it then. Yeah, he had forgotten. He ran the 1189 some after they chain ganged the engines, you know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I don't know, I don't know why the 1189 would have been over here. He was thinking of the 1089. The 1189 was one of those big ones that never did work over here. Yes, sir. They went on the main line, too. So they started the chain ganging them, and then the 1189, the 1188, the 1186. They came through here? Yes, sir. They, they put them oh. on 25 and 26. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's 1927. right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's before they put stokers on them. That's yes, sir, right. that's right. They were still hand fired. That's right. And 1196. 1197 and 11, uh, 1153 and... I got pictures of nearly all of them. Yes. Taken at other times. 1197 was on number three somewhere when I took, coming into Oakland, yeah. Yes, sir. On number three. But he, but he, he didn't remember the 1114. No, sir. He, I knew it wasn't, I knew the number then, you know. Yeah. But, when he climbed down off the engine, they told him that Ms. Dunn had died. He, he never he never worked another day. They were very close from what I've heard. Miss yes. Lever used to tell me once in a while, tell me a few little things about the family, and they were a very close family. They were a family that kind of, that uh, I've always had the feeling that the Lord might have been just a little bit proud of Mr. Dunn because Mr. Dunn was proud of his association with the Lord. Yes, sir. He was a devout man. My daddy, see, some of the men scoffed at this thing of Mr. Dunn being so holy. They said he was a reprobate. My daddy didn't ever think so. He said that he was a, an honorable man, a very forceful man, and when he put himself into anything, he went all the way. He, uh, he believed that the highest profession in the world was being a passenger engineer on the Illinois Central Railroad. Well, I told you one time what he told somebody, that the, the three most important institutions in the world were the United States government, the Methodist Church, and the Illinois Central Railroad, and he belonged to all three of them. <laughs> and he was real proud of that. Mr. <laughs> uh, Lever told me that when Lucius finished at the academy, 1908 or 9 somewhere. The family all went up 
And when the ceremony started, they couldn't find Mr. Dunn. He wasn't with Mama. He called her Mama. Mama and the girls were out there, and the Papa wasn't there. They got to looking, and he was up on the stage with all the admirals and the vice president. And what had happened? They found out later. He had gone up to shake hands with all of them. He was a great handshaker. Yes, sir. And uh, one of the uh, stewards thought he was a senator, a big, fine-looking man like that. Had to be a senator. So he went and got him a chair and sat him down up on the stage. Well, he sat there. He was as big as any of the rest of them. <laughs> and uh, people kind of laughed about it when they came home, and it made the family mad because Papa was just as important.